Rodolphe, bonjour. Bonjour, John. Great to see you. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure. Let me just get my screen here uh, together here. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. So, uh, how are you? How are things in Champagne? The sun is shining. <laughs> we wait for, uh, you, you know, um, it's, it's not usual, but we wait for some rain now. It's, it's too sunny. This year is too dry. It's too sunny. We, we have something like, uh, we are something like two weeks early. Uh, we expect to peak again in, uh, in uh, August. So we would like some cooler weather and some rain, unusually for Champagne. And now, usually, now, are you making vintage um, champagnes every year? Because now it, kind of, it used to be sometimes, you know, a long time ago that only certain years would be declared vintages and certain years wouldn't. But now it seems like uh, a lot of the great producers, you know, like yourself, are making every year. Or you still don't declare every year. How do you decide that? Ah, okay. Depends on the um, on the cuvee, basically. Uh, in, 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 in our ranch, for example, we, we, we consider a cuvee like uh, L'Esprit, uh, which is a, a vintage, a millésime cuvee, uh, in a different way than uh, a single vineyard like Les Chétillon, or we will talk about Les Montjoly as well. It's two different stories for me. Uh, single vineyards must be released every year. It's a vineyard story. So for the market, I think, important to show how uh, what's happened in a specific block or in a specific terroir uh, a vintage uh, also if you claim that it's a fantastic terroir you must be able to release the the, the wine whatever the vintage uh, as, uh, inversary i even think you show the market you show people you prove it's an outstanding terroir if you are able to release a proper wine, a very good wine, even from challenging vintages. Uh, 2011 is a perfect example for me. We release an 11 Chetillon, and I'm quite proud of this wine. But considering a vintage, uh, it, a vintage for me is uh, a specific cuvee. Uh, you take the decision to release when uh, you achieve the balance, you know, a kind of perfect balance. So sure, there is more and more vintages released in the market just because I feel like we little by little escaped that, but we lived uh, about 20 years of a golden age. I mean, when, where uh, everything was easy. Uh, it was really easy to achieve a good maturity, good balance, um, simply because of the harvest period. You know, we were used to pick our grace mid of September. In Champagne, Northern France, it means uh, a kind of Indian summer. So dry days, cool nights, sunny, uh, just perfect to wait, like very comfortable to reach. Uh, uh -huh. oh, sorry, as you have something. Cool. Um, uh, Sorry? It's a question for the group. Sometimes yes. Lily throws uh, some polls up there. Uh, um, so I, I, I mean that the, the only reason why you see so many vintages in the market is just because we lived a golden age for the Northern Vineyard. Uh, my father was used to pick his grapes in October. You know, in October at that time, it, it just was a, a huge challenge, you know, to, to fight against the Botrytis development, to wait for ma uh, the end of maturation, uh, while the days started to be shorter, the weather was rainy, and so not the same story, you can't compare, you know. Uh, sure, in October, you had less uh, chance Lex uh, looked to be able to uh, achieve a perfect maturation, you know, and, and no botrytis. Early September or mid of September, it was, it was much easier. 
But little by little, we escape that because we know more and more pick our grapes in uh, August. Because you know whether oh, it's changing. Go ahead, sorry. Is there sorry? a little delay? Sorry, okay. Um, no, I was saying I think it's great that you make uh, the champagnes every year because I, as a collector and lover of old wines, want to see every vintage and its, its expression. Sure. And I think now that's really starting to happen in Champagne as the market's changing and more and more great producers are becoming discovered and known in the marketplace um, such as yourself. And um, so but, I, I'm all... Uh, you know, also for me, uh, doing that for Les Chétillons, it's a kind of crusade, you know. Um, uh, it's something like 15 years, there is more and more new players, I mean growers, uh, young guys, and um, okay, they are from less well-known uh, areas, less well-known terroir, so non-grand cru, and little by little, they started to explain that the classification doesn't mean anything, and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. Okay, when everything goes fine, so during the 20 years of golden age, that's true, we were challenged by less good terroir. But it's not, it was not a big deal just because what is a great terroir? What is a Grand Cru? It's just a place where things are going better when the weather is challenging. When you have too much rain or when you lack of rain, when you uh, have too much heat, uh, waves or when you lack of uh, warm, it's a place where things are easier. So it means that you show it's a Grand Cru when you leave, you experience a challenging vintage. So if you have to buy, uh, let's say 2011, for, uh, for example, it's, it's better to make your choice for a Grand Cru terroir than a, a, a less well-known terroir. Right, right. So um, you talked about uh, Grand Cru. Obviously, you have some great vineyards, uh, access to great sure. vineyards, and, and you own some great. Is that the vineyards behind you in that in that picture there? Is that the, uh, the estate? Uh, <laughs> uh, behind, behind me, it's Le Menil. <laughs> it's, ah. it's the first advertising uh, uh, created by my great grandfather. It's Le Menil, actually. And are all your vineyards in Luminio? How many different champagnes are you making right now? What's uh, what's going on with your with the terroirs? Uh, let's you're say champagnes you're making. It's it's uh, we operate twenty hectares. Uh, we own uh, and we keep nineteen hectares for our own, our own production of the nineteen hectares. It's sixteen seated in the Côte des Blancs. Sure, not everything in the Menil Surge, but it's a, it's a good 11, 12 hect hectares in the Menil Surge, but we also operate vineyards in Auger, Avis, and Cramont, uh, and a, a small block in Vertus as well. So most of our vineyard is located in, in the Côte des Blancs, and uh, we sell aboard exclusively uh, uh, cuvées made of, of Grand Cru, so made from the Côte des Blancs grapes. We keep, for some reason, uh, the non Grand Cru grapes for the French market. Okay, very so, nice. Yes. But sure, uh, Chetillon is from Le Menil, and uh, we will talk about uh, uh, Les Mont Jolis. It, it, both are from Le Menil Sorge. It's really where our story started, it's, uh, it's, it's really connected to uh, our history. And you have a great history as um, I get ready to kind of, speaking about all this champagne, I have to uh, get something ready here to take a little taste uh, myself. I wanted to have that kind of celebratory pop, you know, it's something always so nice you know, to share that pop with everybody when you open up a bottle of champagne <laughs> and such. And that's I, I already thing. opened the bottle. <laughs> you already, yes. Well, it's a little later than you do. You know, already I have my desk. I don't mind starting early. This is about, you know, I try to wait till noon. 
uh, usually anyway till I start. Uh, I, I, I like I like my champagne uh, warming up a little, you know, uh, simply because. When champagne is really good, it's basically a wine. So you can pour it and drink it uh, almost same temperature as for a white wine. Right. So uh, between... And there we go. That's what I was looking for. Cheers. Now I have an important question for you. We have, I have two glasses with me. I have these very nice traditional flute. I think it's like some Baccarat my mom gave me for something or other. Uh, then keep I have it for your mom. <laughs> <laughs> I have... Um, and so I have these two glasses. Now there's a lot of discussion with the champagne lovers about what glass to use, starting to drink the champagnes in a wine glass more than a flute. What are your thoughts about it? I'll do a little taste test and pour some in each, but I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are. You, you know, I don't like to, uh, to tell something uh, definitive. Uh, depends on, on the moment. Uh, if you want to please your mom, uh, or, or your grandmother, you can you can have a, a nice day, a, a, a nice nice uh, uh, toast with uh, with a flute. Uh, uh, pour your champagne uh, cooler and drink it, but don't taste it. If you want to really enjoy to taste certain cuvee, uh, yes, use a, a, a white wine uh, glass. I think it's. Um, it's a universal Zalto. I have, uh, uh, it's a kind of universal as well, uh, made by uh, Jensis Robinson. Mm -hmm. I like my champagne in a white wine uh, glass. Uh, basically, when we um, figure out uh, our winemaking, our blend, we first think how to make a good white wine. And, and bubbles is a, a second step, but we can't expect to make good champagne if we don't start from a very good wine. So right. drink it like a wine, same yeah. temperature, same glasses. Well, you can see right away, like, I mean, you can't really get the same aromas in a flute that you get in a wine glass. I mean, there's ah, so sure many not. right? No, no, I told you, if you want to please your mom, Use the flute. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to please your palate, use a white wine glass. <laughs> if it's cheap champagne, use the flute and just drink it quickly, right? <laughs> but for Pierre Peters, we like the wine glass for sure. So um, you spoke about your family a little bit, and I think it's very important that you're a, the sixth generation of, of the Peters family in, in Champagne, correct? Correct. Uh, yes, this picture is fine because uh, on the left, she, it is my great grandfather, Camille Peters, the first uh, took the decision to e elaborate champagne. So he released his first vintage in 1919. Uh, his wife, Solange, and my grandfather, Pierre Peters, so the name of the brand now, who really uh, developed the business, extended the vineyard. It, it, he is really the man of uh, the fourth generation. Uh, the he lot of, the, lot of the, uh, the son, right? Yes. 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 He, he, he was uh, the eldest of uh, five. Uh, his brothers passed away very young, and then uh, uh, his father passed away also right before World War II, and um, he was quite young, 20, something like 20, and he took his family in charge, his four young uh, sisters and uh, his mother. So he vinified for three years. Um, so the name of uh, his father brand was Camille Peters. And before to launch his own brand, uh, so Pierre Peters, he, he, he managed uh, another brand called Veuve, Camille Peters for three years before to take the decision to release his own brand. Yes, he is really the man for me. Uh, he started from, uh, uh, Camille has quite a large vineyard, but my grandfather has to uh, share with his four sisters. So he started from four hectares, three, four hectares. And when my father took over, uh, Peters already operated uh, uh, 16 hectares. So really, really, really 
uh, took advantage of also a nice period to uh, extend the vineyard. I mean, right after World War II, the 50s, the 60s, for uh, an entrepreneur, it was full of opportunity, uh, especially to buy in the Côte des Blancs. Right now, it's another story. I mean, the Côte yeah, how is it right now? I mean, do vineyards come up? I mean, if, but just the big... No, houses. there is actually nothing for sale. Or, or when you hear about... Uh, uh, opportunity is too late. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's bigger player cool. already uh, take your take their hand on the on the lands. So it's almost impossible to buy. First, it's expensive, but but basically, it's almost impossible to buy. Right. right. Are, 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 do you also do, does every grape every uh, grape you harvest or, or make? Or use? Do you own all of them, or do you still get buy some grapes, or like a negociant style of buying grapes? Well, actually, so uh, um, as I told you, we operate twenty hectares. I keep nineteen hectares of the of the uh, uh, to be really precise, eighteen point five, because I sell one hectare. I operate one hectare in the hope, and uh, sorry to tell, but uh, it's not. Uh, the same league, and and I'm not interested in, in in making wine from from Pinot Noir from the Aube. Uh, uh, so I sell those grapes. And same thing for young vineyards. Uh, it's an half hectare of young Chardonnay in the Cezanne uh, area. I don't keep for uh, for Pierre Peters as well. Uh, and then you know we are a real grower, so we don't buy grapes except by regulation, we are allowed to buy 5%. And I took advantage of this regulation to buy, uh, to deal with a friend of mine uh, called um, uh, Jean-Baptiste Geoffroy uh, to make uh, a rosé. You know, Peters is not uh, releasing Chardonnay exclusively. We also have a small cuvee called uh, uh, Rosé for Alban under the first name of my daughter. Uh, a, a kind of way to involve the next generation uh, uh, and uh, since we we operate Chardonnay grapes exclusively I had to find a way to uh, to to put some red colors in my <laughs> in my Chardonnay and a friend of mine do you know Jean-Baptiste Geoffroy from René Geoffroy he's uh, quite a famous uh, grower as well oh yes yes Yes, yeah. he's for me one of the master for the Seigneur process, especially. And since I wanted to blend my rosé, not from red, red wine and white wine, but a Seigneur and Chardonnay, uh, I deal with uh, Jean-Baptiste and luckily for me, he accepted to elaborate a Seigneur made of Meunier to be blended with my Chardonnay to uh, produce my own rosé. But that, that's it. I don't buy any other kind of grapes or, or wine like that. Okay. No, our, our wine are exclusively made of, uh, of our Chardonnay. Let's talk about the Cuvée de Reserve, Blanc de Blanc, 100% Chardonnay. So this is kind of, um, I guess, the, the, the regular champagne, if you will, the standard, uh, you know, but it's, it's far from regular. Let's say, let's say the flagship. Flagship, that better. That's a better word. Yes, flagship. Uh, no, it's really, uh, it's really this way I see this cuvee. Um, certainly not an entry-level wine. Uh, basically, I put my name on the label. I put that it comes from Grand Cru grapes. It can't be average. It must be in the top of uh, his game. Uh, mm. And you know, uh, maybe certain person consider that uh, Peter's success comes from Le Chetillon. Peter's success for me comes from the, the very good level of this flagship champagne. And it's, it brings together all our uh, winemaking philosophy. Uh, I mean that this wine is, uh, is not made as a regular non-vintage wine. I mean, we don't take uh, a large percentage of uh, the, the yearly uh, uh, wine plus uh, something like 30 percent a few other vintages to be blended together we uh, we created um, uh, in 
something like uh, 25 years ago, uh, a perpetual reserve. I mean that rather than to uh, blend different vintages together to, uh, to, uh, to make this wine, we took the decision in 97, actually, to for, for perpetual reserve. Yes, I'm familiar. I will explain you why. Uh, I took over the, I took over, it's, it's really connected to our family. You know, um, you, you must uh, um, understand that we have a very important family uh, rule. Um, one person per generation can uh, uh, take over and generation after generation. So my father, he was not the eldest, the eldest was uh, Jacques Peters, my uncle. Jacques Peters was a former Veuve Clicquot winemaker, so he, he ran uh, Clicquot uh, cellar for 37 years. He was the eldest, but it was my father who was dedicated to take Pierre, the Pierre Peter Champagne uh, over. Just one person. Same for me. Jacques and my father took the decision for me to take over. But I had to wait that my father decide to retire before to take over. Uh, it's not a so long time ago. It was in 2007. But uh, I graduated in enology in 93. And as soon as I, my father considered I was, uh, let's say, allowed to participate to the blend, to the testing, he invited me. He really offered me many occasions to come for harvest, to come for. And from 97 to 2007, in some way, he teach me Peter's style and Peter's philosophy, which is great. It means almost 15 years of education uh, without pressure for me, but also without pressure for him because he didn't have the young guys full of energy, want to take his, his, <laughs> his post, you know what I mean? Uh, it was clear. But I was allowed to suggest, and this cuvee, you know, is really the result of one of my suggestions. Actually, in 97, my father started to prepare his blend, and I said that I didn't like, I, I didn't agree the way he, uh, his decision. But it's easy to say no, but I feel it's, it's, it's good to say no if you can suggest them. And I explain why. And why? Just because my father was used to blend his non-vintage, mainly of a single vintage, so it was 97, plus a very small percentage of reserve wine. So something like 20%. Except that 97, came right after two outstanding vintages, 96 and 95. And I explained, that my, I explained my father that for me, it was a big issue uh, with, a, with a grower at this period. I mean that why the grower were not as successful as they are now, just because they were not able to release consistent quality of non-vintage year after year. And why? because they, never took, they dev, never took the decision to have enough reserve wine in their non-vintage. And 97 was a perfect example. If you release 97 right after 96 and 95, show you uh, with too little uh, uh, reserve wine, show the wine will be not same level as the, uh, as the two previous. And I suggested my father actually to sacrifice all his reserve wine to blend the 97. Don't ask me why, but he said yes. He said yes, he accepted that. Probably because he got the reason uh, and the big issue. He understood, I opened his mind, I think. Uh, we, when you are not really involved 100%, you see things uh, you can't see when you are too involved into your business. Anyway. He sacrificed everything. We blended uh, his tank of 88 with his tank of 90, 93, 95, 96. Everything together as a bigger base to be blended with 97. I'm sure we didn't bottle all the, all the blends. 
we butchered a portion and keep uh, uh, some uh, a part aside as a base for the next one. And it's, it's, it's the beginning of the story of the perpetual reserve. Since 97, the cuvette reserve is always made this way. So we blend and, and it's 12 years now, it's 50-50. So this cuvette is probably the 20, 2016 base cuvette de reserve. By the way, for every people attending uh, the, the seminar, if you want to know, take your uh, phone and scan the QR code. The QR code is not about uh, um, uh, uh, marketing and it's a traceability system. If you scan it, you access the base year, the date of disgorgement, uh, many other information. And for us, it's also a tra traceability uh, system. Anyway, so this QV is really made like, a, a, not a solera, a perpetual reserve. And so you continue, so every, it has the disgorgement gate, date on it, it says June 2019. So every um, bottle of the Cuvée de Reserve has 50% one vintage and 50% a mix of older vintages. So you'll say- uh, Actually, it's the previous, the pre previous blend. Uh, if you make a quick ca calculation, this is a 16 uh, uh, base. So right. it means it's based on 50% 16. Right. Plus the cuvée de reserve 15 base. So it means 50% 16, 25% 15, 12.5% 14, and so on. Ah, okay, okay. Back to 1988. Because we okay. always keep a part of the blend as a next base for the next uh, non vintage. Wow. Wow. That's a serious uh, reserve wine. Yeah. I see why you say flagship. I mean, People don't understand. I mean, there's, this goes back to 88. That's amazing. And so uh, have you experimented with aging the Brut Reserve in, in your cellar and, and taking out an old disgorgement? Do you play around with uh, trying different uh, yes. disgorgements? I, I, I did a vertical uh, uh, five years ago, back to 81. Um, but it, it's good. It's good. It, it's the one age like any uh, one from Le Menil, you know. Uh, um, I used to say that Le Menil for me is like the best terroir for Rieslings, you know. These wines never go to um, uh, an oxidation uh, uh, evolution. The more the, the one from Le Menil uh, move and age, the more they refine, the more they show noble reduction, I mean like uh, uh, as a nut, um, toasted as a nut, roasted coffee bean, such a very noble reduction. Uh, it, 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 I feel like, like the best Rieslings, you know, the best Rieslings, they never go oxidated. They, the, the, the Chardonnay from Le Menil, that's the same. They refine to show more and more uh, of their terroir, so I mean the chalk, the oysters flavors, the sea salt flavors, the iodine flavors, and at the same time, I love that, you know, some creaminess mixed with uh, uh, azenuts, uh, roasted azenuts. I'm sure this one can hedge, but don't tell. Uh, uh, if you want to know, <laughs> if you want to know, um, uh, do you know the QV Reserve Oublié? Do you know this why? Reserve, Reserve Oublié. Reserve Oublié, it's a special QV, very rare. We keep for mostly for the top restaurant worldwide. This QV, uh, try, to, um, try to find and test. This QV is actually made of the best of the reserve wine, so in, in some way, the cuvée de reserve. Um, why is the best? Because we, we, we keep the, the reserve. Uh, sorry, my, my phone is uh, talking to me. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, yes, I didn't tell you, but as soon as we blend it, we bottle it 50%, the rest, we store it, we keep it aside, we store it for one more year to as a base for the next blend. And 
Pierre Peters finified everything stainless steel because uh, it's really, um, oh, Mr. Mr. Leonard is with us. <laughs> Hello. Um, um, uh, yes, we vinified everything stainless steel. Why? Because um, my father teach me that if a, a terroir is great enough, first thing is not to impose yourself, impose a strong winemaking to, to the terroir, is to accept to stay behind and just to carry it very carefully and, and very as to make a, as neutral vinification as possible. And we both consider Le Menil is big enough. You know, you don't need to help him to show well, to, to be more bodied. So we took the decision a long time ago. Even my grandfather explained my father, Le Menil doesn't need hope. Just respect this terroir, carry it. Don't uh, grow it, don't try to improve it. Just stay humble, face to this terroir and, and respect it. Um, so we vinified everything stainless steel. But the reserve is stored in three different kinds of containers. Stainless steel tank, concrete tanks, and big barrels, big casks. Uh, uh, Stokinger, probably you know this supplier, big one, 50 hectoliters. Big because we look for the micro oxidation, but not on the texture of the tannins, but, but not of the oaky flavors. Anyway. So the perpetual is stored in three containers, different containers. And before to blend everything together to prepare the new cuvette reserve, I prepare a small blend. I take one from the best NS steel tank, the best concrete uh, tank, and the best cask. I blend them together. It's bottled. The one aged under a natural cork is released five years later as a cuvette called Reserve Oublié. And it's not that bad. <laughs> Trust me, it's not that bad. But basically, <laughs> the blend of the cuvée d'Azer, except the one age one more year in tank on the lease, so gain body, texture, complexity due to the autolytic uh, exchange, uh, and then sure, the one again age five more years on the lease under natural cork, so change. But basically, the DNA of this one is the Cuvée de Reserve. And, and how, how many bottles of uh, the Cuvée de Reserve do you have? More or less 100,000. 100,000, okay. Yes. It's not a huge amount, but... Uh, uh, for a grower, it's a huge amount. For yeah. a grower, it's a huge yeah. amount. Uh, even, you know, we, we will probably talk about uh, Montjoli as we can talk about Chétillon. Yeah. Um, we have the Montjoli, first vintage. It, that it's ever made 2012, correct? Very well, first ever. For the family, the first was 2000, a small try. Ah. Yes, small so try. But vintages of Montjoli that you're just keeping for yourself, or uh, exactly, I still have uh, 12 bottles uh, left. <laughs> nice. Well, the 12 is the first available to the market. We're very excited to, to have it here. So this is a new uh, bottling. First time ever. What what made you decide to make the Montjoli? What is it? Exactly? Uh, I, I would I would rather uh, say why what made that we never release it before. Okay. Uh, the reason why we never release uh, the Montjoli before it's because of the cuvée de réserve. You know my concern now as a winemaker, as a grower, uh, as a champagne producer is to see so many new a single vineyard released uh, every year uh, and yes it's really booming uh, single vineyard is really booming but as I explain you what is the flagship of uh, an estate it is non-vintage and be aware that each time you take the decision to to release uh, what you consider as a top cuvee a single a single vineyard it means that you will take very good wine off to your non-vintage. Okay. The reason why we never release Les Montjoli uh, before, it's the concern to touch the quality 
of the cuvée de réserve. Because we know the Montjoly, actually we own seven parcels in the Montjoly, three hectares, more and less, so it's a lot. It's, it's really enough to make a very good, uh, a very good single vineyard. Um, knowing that we, for Peters, a single vineyard doesn't mean that we take all the wine from a specific terroir. We don't bottle all the wine elaborated from a specific terroir. From the beginning, Les Chétillons is made of the best of Les Chétillons. Actually, we, we, in Les Chétillons, we own three parcels. We will vinify them separately. And Les Chétillons, from the very beginning, I mean 71, which is the very first vintage uh, ever made of Les Chétillons, is the best possible blend made of the three parcels. We vinify the three parcels separately, and then we prepare the best possible blend from the three parts. Same idea for Les Montjoly. And knowing that we also have a rule with Les Chétillons, at least 50% of the wine from Les Chétillons goes to the Cuvée de Réserve. So Les Montjoly, we know it's a fantastic terroir for long, but we also know that it's the backbone of the Cuvée de Réserve. What to do? do? Do you take the risk to, uh, to make your flagship wine less good? No, we never took that decision. Even we, uh, we earn more money releasing Les Montjoly than releasing uh, the Cuvée de Réserve, sure. But it's a short-term point of view. It's a short-term strategy. So what's happened? Actually, in 2012, I told you we have seven parcels in, in Les Montjoly, three in Les uh, When we prepare to pre-blend, the pre-blend uh, made from Les Montjoly was showing better than the pre-blend uh, of, of Les Chétillon. But clearly, blind. It was not the first time, honestly. And with my father and my uncle, we actually took the decision to show that, to show that Okay, and it's the it's first time you taste, John? Yeah, of course, it's just you can release. It's, yeah. it's another story compared, compared to Les Chétillons, not the same wine. Um, with my friend, um, uh, Domi Clafon, we had several uh, testing together, you know, side by side. Um, we consider that Les Chétillons is a kind of Perrier, while Les Montjoly is a kind of Genevrière. And there is many connections in between the two wines. Uh, um, anyway, Les Montjoly was showing better than Les Chétillons in, in 2012, Vin Claire. So we said we have to show that. It's, it's, does, it's, it's another face of Le Menin, and we have to show that. But you know what? We took the decision to take a very small portion. Les, right. Les Montjoly, from more than three hectares, we can really easily blend 25,000 bottles even more. Les Montjoly, we actually state a new rule and said, Les Montjoly will never be more than 2,000 bottles. Wow. Whatever the pressure, whatever, <laughs> 2,000 bottles. So it also means that we did not affect uh, the quality of the cuvée de réserve. But at the same time, we are able to show another face from the mini chirurgy. Um, uh, Lily, may, may we have the, the map of uh, the focus map on the uh, mini? It will help me to show uh, where both uh, terroirs are located. Yes, so as you can see uh, on the right of the mini uh, where the mini is written, you have Les Chétillons. Les Chétillons is uh, the middle side of the slope, uh, started from a terroir called La Côte. Um, it's, um, if you see the village, go right down to the village and you can see a word called La Côte. It means the hill. It's a top part of uh, the vineyard and Les Chétillons is actually the middle part of this slope. And if you start from Les Chétillons, follow up down, you will go through Les Musettes, then Les Coulmets, 
Then Lemon Joli and then Lemon Martin. Uh, it's clearly the best band of land, currently the best band of land in Le Ménil sur Roger. Uh, except that what makes the difference in between Les Chétillons and Lemon Joli is that Les Chétillons is seated in a, you know, even it's same situation in the slope. A slope is never perfectly flat. You have some waves. Le Chétillon is in the top of a wave, so it clearly means that Le Chétillon has almost no topsoil uh, uh, because of erosion. While Le Montjoli, in Versary, it's more in the bottom part of a wave, has more topsoil, get more sediment, and not exactly the, même, the same constitution. Chétillon is really tiny topsoil, soft chalk. Le Montjoli, is topsoil, some clay with flint, very important. It's one of the only places in Le Méni where you find uh, the famous mix of clay and flint because it's, it's, it's very important to got it because that's all the character of uh, uh, Les Monts Jolies. Uh, I'm sure then the same soft chalk, very high OD, very about sea salts and sea flavors. Um, so Chétillon finds his backbone from the chalk. So, uh, and it's surprisingly very lush. Uh, it's not only about uh, mineral, mineral, mineral. No, it's, it's, uh, it's full of lush, uh, um, surprisingly, for Le Ménil. But Montjoli, but I consider Chétillon like uh, very, it's probably not very positive, but angular, like a big block of, of chalk. Les Monts Jolies is rounder due to the, the, the clay, uh, as some smoke hints due to the flint, uh, and it fool your body. Chétillon goes very straight, very, you know, like a big block. Les Monts Jolies will, will please you. Certain people testing Les Monts Jolies already, they told me, wow, it's very enjoyable, even young. Uh, it means that he has less long-lasting long potential. Believe me, that's not true. And to be back to the story with, um, uh, as I told you, we tested several times side by side with uh, Dominique Lafon. It's like to explain Dominique Lafont, your Genie has no long lasting potential. <laughs> Even Genie used to show better when young than Les Perrières. That's the same for Chétillon and Le Montjoli. So, Do you like? So now we're going to make the Montjoli every year moving forward. Same ideas for Les Chétillons. You can't claim. It's a great terroir if you are not able to raise a very good one every year. Okay. It's just good, good. We look a way to, to show people that it's really, really a good terroir. We are excited that we do have a few six packs of the Montjoli. Uh, for anybody that's interested in trying some, you know, uh, please let us know afterwards. Um, very excited about that, and thank you for that. Uh, yes, sir. And. Um, how, uh, Lily, we had a, a few questions. Uh, from how, is it, how is it, John? I know the oh. wine, I don't want to. <laughs> For me, he has more white flower flavors. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe more direct first, and then it full your mouth. Yeah, I, I feel the kind of this, the, the, the warmth of the sun a little bit more than, the, you know, that sunny fruit. And, you know, immediately it kind of, makes me like stand up, the finish, you know, it kind of makes me stand up a little bit and be like, oh, you know, I gotta, it wakes me up and it's got a great long finish that's very vibrant and, and really serious. I mean, it's an exciting champagne for sure. And- um, Vibrant, I like, I like that vibrant. Yes, he has that kind of vibrancy. Um, uh, you can explain uh, why, but he has that kind of vibrancy. Yeah, in, yeah. in a vintage, it's not supposed to be the, the case. You know, 2012 is a great vintage in Champagne, but small yield, very sunny. So it, it's supposed to be charming, very concentrated, and uh, 
but it's le menil. Le menil has always that kind of vibrancy to balance even generous vintages. Yeah, pretty much the, the greatest terroir in, in Champagne, I think, uh, has to be Le Menil. I mean, uh... Uh, for, I mean, if you want to release a single vineyard, yes, probably not the best to be blended with others. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. We have some questions, I think, from some fans and uh, yes. guests that Lily might uh, ask us. Um, so I know we're not drinking Chétillon today, um, but uh, one viewer asked what your favorite vintage of Chétillon is that you've produced, not from your father or grandfather, but that you've produced. <laughs> uh, the best ever for me is, uh, oh, I like 2007. It was my first wine. You know, it's like uh, to tell you it's my first baby. <laughs> and for your first baby, you are so focused, you are, uh, and good that it was, I started by a challenging vintage because ne next to 2007, I faced 2008. It helps you to, uh, to really got that, okay, it's not always very easy. And, and so the reason why I like 2007 because it was a very demanding vintage and it was my first one. Then, uh, already release or to come? We'll take a preview if there's something. And already released, clearly, already released, clearly 2008. It's a top vintage, but uh, uh, not a big surprise to tell you 2008. To come, uh to uh, 17 or 19. Okay. 17 or 19 and why because uh it i really feel like i told you i feel like we escaped the golden age i mean where the time everything was perfect in terms of whether we can reach perfect balance perfect maturity keep the freshness very easily like in a share waiting for the good day uh, now we have to make a serious decision, tight. Uh, and 17, maybe you heard that it's an awful vintage. Be aware that it was, it was very challenging for the red grapes variety. They were touched by rot, by botrytis, but Chardonnay was just perfect. I had a discussion with uh, Jean-Baptiste Lecaillon, the winemaker of Roderer, and uh, he crossed a room, you know, it, it was organized for, for a, a magazine called Revue des Vins de France, so famous magazine. He crossed the room just to ask me, Rodolphe, what do you think about 17? Because I know you make Chardonnay, excuse me. I said, I never faced that kind of vintage. I took my father notebooks. I didn't see such a vintage described in his, his, his notebook. I had to go back to my grandfather notebooks. And it, it's something like 59. And he said, no, no, it's, it's not true. It's not 59, it's 47. Just to, to tell you how great is this vintage for the Chardonnay. Uh, but uh, that kind of old school vintages, I mean, old school, but not cool. Very warm, very concentrated, but still with, uh, as John explained, a, a very impressive vibrancy to balance the density, the richness of the wine. 70s it would be great in my opinion, and 19 is, is the same animal, same kind of uh, vintage. Speaking about the history of the domain and your favorite vintages, do you have a favorite vintage of Le Chetillon that your father or grandfather produced? Uh, easy to tell because I had a great review for a cuvée called uh, Heritage. You know, I was stupid enough <laughs> to take the decision to take all the best vintages of the family library to blend uh, a cuvée called Heritage. Uh, let's say that last year we celebrated the, 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 um, the 100th anniversary of the first vintage elaborated by Camille Peters in 1919. And, uh, I took the decision to uh, release a cuvée to celebrate, but more than to celebrate, to pay tribute to, uh, to those uh, amazing winemakers. So, and 
nothing better than to show their wine. That's the way I, I, I figure out the, the blend, how to, to, to pay tribute to uh, the previous generation. Show the wine they made. You know, I felt a, a little sad because I'm the first to, uh, to escape from the shade of the big names. You know, Champagne was only about Moëté Chandon and, and, and the big names uh, when my father was in charge, was, when my grandfather was in charge, and even more when my great-grandfather was in charge. But they made amazing wines. They can't show that. I'm the first generation uh, 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 able to do that. So no other way than to blend them, their, their best wine together to create something crazy called uh, heritage. Uh, so really blended from the best vintages elaborated by the family. Um, if, so it, it's 19 different vintages. The best of all clearly was 1947. Uh, 47 was incredible. Almost this color, not, not dark, uh, lightly gold, but not brown, not dark at all, very lively, amazing wine. Uh, the more emotional was definitely uh, 21, uh, especially because it was uh, not under cork, not uh, on the lees, but disgorge, and level of disgorgement this time. So something like 90 grams, but just a proof, and really for you to know, sugar is not an enemy. It's a preserver, it's, it's a preservative. You know, it will, keep the wine for a long time. And thanks to 90 grams per liter sugar, the wine was showing very well. Very into um, uh, candied citrus, hazelnuts uh, uh, again, like sweet and, uh, you know, when the hazelnuts are full of um, sugar and roasted, tasted like that. So I love the wine and also, the best vintage made by my father, 85. It, it, it was a great, the three great wines of the, of the series. Um, I have one more question back to John, but you've spoken a little bit about Botrytis in Champagne. Yes. And I know historically some producers included Botrytis in their blending on purpose by accident due to kind of sorting procedure. In tasting all of those back vintages, did some of them have Botrytis in them? You know, there is a perfect example, 2002. Do you consider 2002 like a good vintage in Champagne? Yes, it is. Uh, it was a vintage touched by Botrytis, but a good one. And that the reason why you find so much um, uh, hint of, uh, um, uh, it's a spice, uh, uh, saffron in 2002. It comes from the Botrytis. So Botrytis give, if it's not the, the bad one, if it's at, in some way the same as for Sauterne, or uh, we can have that kind of botrytis if the weather turned well uh, in Champagne. It's just an extra bunch of uh, flavors, and um, mostly about uh, 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 spices. And first hint is saffron. And in 2002, you used to find the saffron. Uh, it comes from the botrytis. You know, the best one always show if it's too clean, if it's too perfect, it's not emotional. You need a small defect to touch you. You know, it's, it's the stone, you can start your story with the wine. If it's too perfect, Okay, you enjoy, but there is no emotion. Right. Lily said the uh, same thing about me and all my defects all the time. So I guess <laughs> it's a good thing. I'm, I'm very glad to hear that from you. Um, so I want to go back to the heritage because it's a very special thing. I mean, this is a once in a lifetime. Uh, yes, right? clearly. Right, to celebrate the 100th anniversary. What are there, 20 vintages in it all together? And, uh, 19, 19. 19. 19, yes, to connect to 1919. Ah, beautiful, beautiful. Yes. And uh, I mean, it's real. how many cases of that did you make uh, in total? 
uh, totally it's uh, it's 1000 cases uh, no 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 uh, no 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 100 cases it's 100 it, okay. for french you know cases <laughs> is uh, something so no actually 120 it's it's something like 100 uh, 1500 bottles totally ah i lose you what's wrong with john we lost, Many we lost John. John. Um, so we do. Oh. Uh, about anyone about, here? about so heritage to tell a little more about this one. Uh, you must uh, understand and got that it's not still wine blended together. It's really bottles kept in the family li library. We took them, we opened them to create a new uh, blend and to bottle the wine. So uh, the, the detail of the blend is quite simple. Don't ask me why, it's just because you have to follow a rule. It has never been made, so I have no idea what can be the good blend. So I took the decision to take uh, that a third of the blend must be made of very old wine. So from 21 to 96 represented a third of the blend. Then I took one from the 2000, 2002, 2004, 2008, a second third. And theoretically, when I, I learned enology, you can't succeed to undergo for a, a prise de mousse, so a second alcoholic fermentation in a bottle, with less than 50% vin clair. So, but I took the risk because I want to, uh, uh, I want a lot of space for the mature vintage to show. Took the risk to take only a third percent of vin clair. And it was the best wine uh, was to 2010. So represented a third. Theoretically, Theoretically, it was supposed to be 50%. It was just a third to, to leave enough space for the one from the 2000 and the very old one to show. And, and what was the dosage on that? Uh, four grams. Four grams. Four, 4.5 grams. Yes. The one wine we haven't spoken about yet is the Etonant Monsieur Victoire. Uh -huh. Étonnant, Monsieur Victor, Lily. Non, 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 again, Lily, again. <laughs> étonnant, Monsieur Victor. Uh, what is étonnant, Monsieur Victor? Uh, I told you that um, I elaborate uh, a rosé, champagne rosé, uh, called uh, um, um, rosé for Alban, uh, under the first name of my daughter. Actually, I have two children, Alban my daughter and the eldest, Victor, my son. Uh, and uh, I explain you a lot about wine, but you know, in some way, my first role, my first responsibility, and, and, and I will turn 50 soon, uh, is uh, to create connection and to involve the next generation. Uh, knowing that I don't want to push any pressure on the shoulder of my children, so I encourage them to live their uh, passion. So I encourage them so much that my son is studying art, uh, he's a student at the Louvre School, and my daughter is studying uh, architecture. She's, she's studying a national school of architecture. So none of them are involved in, uh, in wine. Uh, I, I, think, I, think, I think Sebastian is willing to help. He could maybe take over, you know, if, if you need somebody to come in, you but, know, for the next you know, John, generation. You know, John, I'm yeah. very happy because really it's what I want for my children. Uh, I want they leave their passion. Uh, I don't want they feel obliged to take over because you don't make any good one. You can't make good one if you do by respect for the previous generation or because you feel obliged to. You must, it must be your own decision. You must, uh, it must be your passion. It must be your number one passion in life if you, you really 
Because once again, if you want to create emotional one, you can give part of yourself. You, are, yeah. you must yeah. be ready to do that. And if you do by interest or by obligation, you, you never give part of yourself. So you just create proper funny wine, but never serious good wines. No, uh, I want that for the next generation. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually very happy that they live their life. Uh, I just try to make the business sexy enough for the ne next generation. And also, uh, I used to explain that I feel like an angler, a fisherman. I send two flies. I will wait that one of my children catch one of the fly. Right. So right. for my daughter, the fly is the rosé. And Letton Monsieur Victor, so <laughs> call under the name, after right. the name right. of, of uh, Victor, my son, is the second fly. Uh, I told you Victor is a student uh, in art uh, and he loves art. And the idea was to create something who brings together my passion, the one and his passion, art. And um, I think you, you, you got that. I don't think the best from Champagne is single vineyard, single vintage. The best from Champagne is clearly that kind of crazy project like Heritage. I mean, to blend the history together. Uh, especially since, you know, we are the only one, the only one allowed to blend multi-vintage. Right. Why to? copy others uh, like Burgundy who are not allowed to blend multi-vintage but dream of, they dream yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I understand. I think it's because the market kind of thinks, you know, that the vintage is like the better thing, you know, because of the Bordeaux and Burgundy and, you know, the... the, the... Because of, they, they do that because they have no other choice. Right. <laughs> they would love, you know, when you get a 2004 in Burgundy, you don't think you would like to uh, uh, blend it with some 2002 and 2003 to, to average the quality? Sure. They all dream of. We are allowed to do. Why to release only the entry level one from this process? It's stupid. It's really yeah. stupid. Why, you know, do you like port? Do you like, uh, you know, Tony port? Do you like... Uh, Sherry, you know, such a one that make me dream. You know, when you you drink um, a Madeira made, uh, started uh, uh, hundred and fifty years earlier. You don't drink wine; you drink history. And you can create the same in Champagne if you do it well. And so, Little No Monsieur Victor is basically not a single vineyard, not a, a, a single vintage. Is my best possible non-vintage wine. And you also do, though, release a little bit of Enotech. What is, do you keep some, or you, I don't know if you guys talked about it, but you sell some Enotech uh, no. philosophy there. Uh, you mean for Chetillon? Chetillon yeah. Enotech, right. Ah, Chetillon, yes. Just to, to uh, end up about uh, uh, L'Etonant Monsieur Victor. So L'Etonant Monsieur Victor is the best possible non-vintage wine made by Peters, so easy. I told you that I create a cuvee made of the best of the perpetual reserve called Reserve Oublié. So I take part of the Reserve Oublié as a base for L'Etonant Monsieur Victor, and I take one from the best tank of Les I blend them together, the one aged under cork to, to really um, take everything possible from the autolytic period in the and micro oxidation, and it's released something like five, six, uh, six, seven years later. Uh, and why is it called L'Etonant Monsieur Victor? It means surprising Mr. Victor because my son designed the labels. Uh, and for you to know, he was 15 when he, he designed those labels. Nice. Um, so, about uh, because Yes, I think it's time. Uh, about Les Chétillons, a no tech. Uh, a, a second thing my father let me explore. 
um, he's, he's a generation who stopped to make many things. You know, he stopped to uh, walk the soil, he stopped to uh, disgorge uh, by hand, and I don't know why, see, I know why, because he faced so many troubles. You know, the 70s in, in the vineyard were very challenging. The weather was really not mine. We need really not kind with uh, the, the growers. They, in the 70s, they lost at least one crop every two crops, one harvest every two harvests. When you face such an issue, you try to find any possible ways to survive. It's, it's, it was just to survive. You don't, I don't understand the, the new guys who critics the those generation, they never face that challenge. Uh, they just leave the golden age, as I told you. Anyway, my father stopped to do that, and, but he was really open mind, and I suggested uh, to go back to uh, the traditional bottling. I mean, rather than to top the bottle with a chrome cap, to top it with a natural cork. So it makes everything much, much more challenging to close, to edge, to disgorge, everything more challenging, but it changed the texture of the wine, it changed the complexity of the wine. And first wine we experienced that was Chetillon. First vintage, we were back to this process was Chetillon 2002. We, uh, my father accepted to bottle 10% Chetillon 2000 uh, with natural cork. And we took the decision to add the wine longer than the, regu the regular release, actually 17, uh, 13 years, sorry, not 17, 13 years under cork before disgorger. Um, do you ever test, John? No? I I've seen the I mean, your champagnes are very rare. They do not come, uh, I think the people that buy them they keep them, they don't resell them, you know, because they're very like, they're okay. treasure, you know? So if you put side by side a uh, regular release and for example, 2002, Chetillon, regular release, Chetillon, Enotech, uh, I think like Chetillon, regular release is like people know uh, know Chetillon uh, and Chetillon Edge. Chetillon, regular release, he, 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 as I told you, he refined to go to the chalk, uh, let's say, a lot of oysters, a lot of toast. Chetillon Enotech has all his attributes, these attributes, but is more opulent. Thanks to exa extra time on the lease and thanks to the microoxidation. And uh, we also know there is something happening between the tannins of the cork and the wine. And it can be good. Uh, so that's the main difference. Still with the purity, the uh, very impressive youngness, freshness, but a little more opulent. And talking about dosage, a shetty on a tech is disgorged quite high higher than a regular release. A regular release used to be disgorged between four to five grams per liter. Chetillon Otec is disgorged 5.5. Because we disgorge the wine at least two and a half years before the release. So for example, we will release 2004 this year. The wine has been disgorged in December 17, will be released from June. So two and a half years later. Well, I think we have Sebastian. Do we have um, we have some special lots? Uh, we're doing a big charity auction this week that closes Sunday at eight o'clock. We hope everybody tunes in. It's to benefit uh, the uh, United uh, Sommelier Foundation, yes. right? And then also some to benefit the French, the French, the French Sommelier as well, John. And there's an Inotech in in uh, one of and those. there's the Etonant Monsieur Victor as well. Yes, okay. Inotech 2002. Yes, exactly. Uh, and what's the third? Isn't there three bottles in each lot? There's a... Yes, three bottles each uh, lot. Correct. Right. What's the third bottle? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's uh, Montjoli. Ah, Montjoli. Okay, great. Yeah, so those three, it's like a three bottle uh, custom case because you can't 
I mean, you can't buy the Monsieur Victor or the Innotech. You don't see them. So a nice opportunity this weekend. And uh, before we wrap things up, I just want to ask you, how, how's business in Champagne? How, uh, what's going on, obviously, since the pandemic started? I mean, you know, uh, what's going on with, with sales? For, for, you know, obviously, the production is still happening. Um, how, how, how is, has, uh, have you been affected or, or is the, the business of Champagne going right now? Uh, I'd say, yes, Champagne is uh, deeply touched. Uh, we talked about uh, minus uh, 60%. Minus 63, exactly. Uh, average three last uh, months. Yes, people, they enjoy wine, but they did not really celebrate it. You know, there is no more wedding, no more party. And uh, yes, champagne is really part of party time. And we didn't have so many party time the last months. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, so, yes, yeah, sure. It's... It, Champagne is deeply touched. Um, we take very tight decision. We certainly decrease uh, the production from the next uh, vintage. For the growers, I took with uh, some of my friends, I mean, Beres, Chaton, uh, Savard, uh, Villemar, Laurent Champ. We are, we don't, we are not so, honestly, we don't feel the crisis. Uh, the, our sales are still not strong, but consistent. Probably because we are not wine made to party, but wine, wine, right. real right. wine. Yeah, right, right. And, and as you say, we don't produce so much. So probably uh, our loyal customers still still buy our wine. So we don't feel that, but but. Basically, we will be touched indirectly because if champagne sales drop down, we will, we, the, the, our right to uh, bottle, so it's called appellation, will also drop down. So it means we will, we will not be able to bottle the same quantity of wine that the previous year to regulate, simply to regulate. Yeah. Yeah. Champagne, Champagne is really strict. It's really, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, so if Champagne decide to decrease the production, we will be touched. Even we sell, we can sell our wines. What does that mean? Can you make it and sell it and hold it or you can't even make it? Uh, we will, we will produce them, harvest them, finify them. And at the end of the year, we will have to, to send the extra part to a distiller. Really? For like really? For, for alcohol? Wow. Yes. Yes. That's, I've never heard that. That's incredible. Yes. Yeah, that's, it's, it's not that's fun. mandatory, right? That's mandatory to regulate the champagne. Exactly. 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 Not to regulate the cell, but basically, you know, you have to go that champagne is made of uh, growers, but not growers like me. I mean, people who own lands produce grapes and have to sell their grapes to the negotiant. And the lands are owned, 80%, 85% of the land are owned by the growers. And more or less 75, 80% of the champagne is sold by the negotiant. So there is a big transfer. If the negotiant don't need grapes and you don't regulate, the appellation, some growers will sell their grapes, but some other they will not sell. The sole solution, the only way is to decrease the, the average production so you make sure every grower can sell his grapes or at least part of these grapes. It's not to regulate the sales, the, the, the bottle sales. It's it's, it's the way Champagne is working. They, Champagne wants everybody, let's say, more or less okay. So don't think market, think intermarket. Right. Yes, Champagne doesn't want some producers without a, 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 a customer. Yeah, I, I mean, grapes customer. That's right. the reason why they will decrease uh, production. 
Well, that's amazing. I mean, this has been an amazing session. I mean, thank you so much, Rodolph. My I mean, pleasure. A great insider's view in the heart of Champagne and Luminil. Uh, congratulations on all your well-deserved success. And, uh, you know, we look forward to sharing a, a little bit of offer of, his, of your wines with the group here. And, and thank you for that. And uh, best of luck. Look forward to seeing you in uh, person. Thank you very much. And, and, and I can't wait to taste for real. <laughs> What's that? I can't wait to taste for real. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, cheers, it has been a pleasure. And we'll see everybody next week. We have a big week next week on Friday. We have uh, Francois LeBay from Chateau de la Tour. We're also launching a new uh, segment on Tuesday and Wednesday. We're going to be drinking with a couple of NBA superstars, J.J. Redick and Carmelo Anthony, which is going to be fun. Tuesday night, Wednesday night, we're going to be balling. So everybody, you know, get ready to ball out Tuesday and Wednesday. And we're going to be back uh, to Burgundy on Friday night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rodolph. And uh, we'll see I you. Cheers. Just, just, just the last word. Okay. Uh, sure, stay safe, take care, but keep in mind to support the, the hospitality industry. You know, uh, we need them. We will need them where we will be back to the normal life, to celebrate, to enjoy uh, wine, good food. And they are right now in a very bad situation. So yeah. please try do everything possible to support them. Uh, they need, on Sundays, they need our help. Organization, you know, support the auction. Obviously, you get your deduction over the normal value. Just, you know, just keep hitting bid. You know, don't even look at the price. <laughs> bid on Sunday. It's a great organization. And, uh, of course, you know, the restaurants that are trying, they're opening up, do the takeout, get, get, get some, a couple meals out if you can every week. Um, you know, it's important. So you're absolutely right. And, and thank you. Cheers to everybody. Cheers. We'll, we'll Cheers. Santé. Santé à tous. Santé. Santé.